Uh, today's video is going to be about, well, let's, what's one of my thoughts between Mac OS and Linux. So yeah, let's spend the next few moments just kind of looking over some of the stuff that I've found really, really beneficial from, uh, from both Mac OS and from Solus. Okay, first of all, I don't even know if you can hear this, but check this out. That is the fans going full tilt because of the screencaster. Anyway, moving on. All right, so here we are on the Mac side of things. Now, um, first of all, I, I want to make a really quick note of, uh, I'm going to pick up the mic again, it's going to sound really janky, but uh, we're recording at 60 frames a second at a 2880 by data something something retina resolution and listen to the fans on Mac. That would be non-existent, as in the, the fans are silent. And this goes to prove one of my points, I guess, um, in that the obvious, the, the obvious benefit to running Mac OS on Mac hardware is the fact that you get much more efficiently coded software for the hardware that it's running on. And really, that is the the far and away biggest difference. Um, things like this affects things like battery life. This affects things like performance. Um, this affects thermal management. Um, even even things like SSD uh, SSB SSD read and write speeds. Um, all of this stuff is taken care of for you in the background with macOS. Now that's the obvious one that I'm just going to get out the way right at the start. Now, some of the other stuff that I think I prefer Mac OS, it comes down to uh, market share and platform. And I guess we could whinge about this all day long, um, but where Linux has a fantastic community behind it, um, Mac has the, uh, the luxury of having a user base that is ready to pay big dollars for the software that they use. For an example, um, let's take a look at some of the stuff here that's in the Mac App Store. And before everyone starts going ape about how terrible the Mac App Store is, it's true, it's old, and a lot of the apps in here are very overpriced. But let's just go with it for the moment. Okay, so as an example, um, some Mac software that uh, that is quite popular these days in terms of um, uh, in terms of creatives is uh, the Affinity Designer Suite. So uh, this is starting to take away some of the market share from Adobe and those guys. And from that point of view, it is actually pretty affordable. Um, $79.99 here in Australia, that's probably about close to 50 in the US. Um, and that's quite affordable for a Mac app considering how much it can do. Now, obviously on the open source side of things, we've got things like GIMP and Inkscape, which can do uh, probably uh, 60 to 70% of what a, a proprietary app like that could pull off. Now, where this gets crazy is when we start looking at things like productivity apps. Now you look at some of the, uh, let's say some of the top grossing uh, productivity apps. This one is a really great example in my opinion. Um, Fantastical 2. Now I'm not knocking the, the quality of this app because I'm gonna to get to that in a second. But the, the this application is $79.99 Australian dollars. So about 50 bucks and it's for a calendar app. Now. I, I, I get it. This calendar app is, is very smart. It's very clever. It's well coded. It's efficient. It looks great. It's designed well. Um, but I can't get over the fact that the Mac OS system and a lot of the software that is in its app store is definitely geared towards people that are not afraid to pay for good quality stuff uh, and pay exorbitantly for good quality stuff. Now, on the Linux side of things, um, there are quite a few great calendar apps out there um, that can do the job for what most people expect. Not only that, there's plenty of web services that can provide great quality uh, software for what most people would expect. But I guess this is one of the things where it is both a blessing and a curse for Mac OS um, in that the software that they have uh, available to users is some of the most uh, beautifully designed, functional, efficient, well-coded uh, software on the planet. Like they just know how to optimize their software to make the best use of the hardware that runs on it. Um, case in point is, uh, I think for me, is Final Cut Pro. Final Cut Pro is one of those apps where once you have used it on, on hardware that maybe isn't all that amazing, you can't believe why uh, you know creative suites like Adobe can be so slow and stodgy. Uh, when an app like Final Cut Pro, you can edit multiple streams of 4K video 
on hardware that is mediocre by video editing standards. Um, so I don't know, the, the, the wizardry that they have going on with uh, how well their apps are coded to their hardware is ridiculous. Um, and it's something that I enjoy benefiting from um, as a Mac OS user. Now we swing back into the annoyance area when we realize that a lot of the software that, uh, that you can install from the App Store and, uh, and a lot of the software that Apple pre-installs on their systems uh, so let's just have a look at the apps made by Apple for a second here. Um, a lot of these uh, apps all have their own siloed, uh, unaccessible really to at least uh, on the surface to the user in terms of the data that they use, the data that they collect um, and, the, and the stuff that you plug into each app. For example, um, on iMovie and GarageBand and, and Final Cut and all of these creative programs, all of their software libraries are isolated um, in in their own silos. You have to go digging into the app data itself to dig up the master original files. Case in point would be the Photos app where you have to go digging into the Photos app itself to find where your actual JPEG photos are. And this is something that really frustrates me about Apple stuff because it makes moving out of the Apple world incredibly hard and that's the way it's been engineered to work. It's efficient, but it also keeps you stuck there. So what the, what the Mac OS world lacks in customization it almost makes up for, almost, depending on what kind of person you are, in how many good quality applets are available or kind of extensions, add-ons, that kind of thing. Now, I realize that there are an abundance of these in the Linux world as well. Some of these things that just kind of live up here in the toolbar and that kind of thing. But, um, but by and large, and again, it does come at a, at a financial monetary price oftentimes, but some of these applets are stupidly... Uh, like amazing in terms of what they can pull off. Um, Alfred, for just a quick example, as a guy who loves a good keyboard launcher, Alfred is like a, it's like a keyboard launcher on steroids. The amount of stuff that you can set up um, and even if you obviously pay more money, you can activate things like power packs, which, um, which kind of work in the same way that a lot of work, uh, like Apple, um, what's it called? Apple Automator or uh, if it or stuff like that, where it, um, actions trigger different things. Um, stuff like Alfred is just, it's got so many features and it's so well uh, coded and it has such a great, uh, and it has such great support behind it that, um, that honestly, it makes you feel like you're living in a computer future um, compared to some of the other keyboard launches that you can get on, on Linux that try to emulate what Alfred um, does. It's just not the same. Um, and honestly, Alfred is a fantastic app in and of itself. But it's just kind of an example of some of the stuff that is out there for Mac specifically um, that you can't get on Windows or Linux. And again, I think it comes down to that premium audience that they want stuff that works really well and they're happy to pay a little bit for it. Um, and then there's just sort of the, the, the wider, um, I guess, third party support. And the bit that I'm noticing the most, the bit that's stinging me the most is when it comes to cloud storage. Um, so for me, I back up uh, photos in Google Photos. I back up my music collection in Google Music so that everywhere I go, I can uh, run the, what is it called? The Google Play Desktop Music Player. So every single uh, distribution operating system that I run, I have the, the Google Desktop Music Player installed. And basically it is a, um, it's basically a skinned web browser of um, the Google Play Music desktop, uh, sorry, the Google Play Music website that has um, all of the, I guess, the native controls of hardware. So, um, so you can jump in and use things like media playback controls and stuff like that and get native notifications and all that sort of fun stuff. Great app in and of itself, um, open source, GPL3, all that fun stuff. Um, so that's a great app. But the uploader that, um, that sits in the background and runs up here in the tray, it automatically scans my music library for new music that I add to it. So then it can upload that to my Google Music. Um, again, this is all automated stuff that I can do relatively easy through a web browser in any operating system I want, but to have it all sitting there automated and done for me is a huge convenience and it's something that is a pain in the butt uh, and currently I'm not aware of a way that you can make this work. Um, also, same with OneDrive and Office uh, and Microsoft Office. They are industry standard tools. A lot of people use them and so when you get sent a file uh, to link into your OneDrive especially, OneDrive is a pain in the butt on Linux at the moment. Um, 
um, at, whereas it just obviously it, it works in Mac OS and Windows very well. Um, I couldn't really care less for, uh, for Office 2016. It is what it is. One note, uh, on the other hand, for me is, is integral to my daily workflow. There is so much that goes on in OneNote. Um, honestly, it's, it's the database of most everything in, uh, in my life. So thankfully they do have a really good, uh, they do have a really good web-based version of OneNote that does most of the uh, tricks that I wanted to. But um, again, it's just one of those things that you miss having a native app when you're on Linux. And that just boils down to third-party support, obviously. So that kind of wraps up most of my thoughts around um, Mac OS versus Linux, at least for what it looks like for me. Um, again, the landscape does look pretty even in terms of um, app support for um, web apps, for uh, Flatpak and Snap on the Linux side of things. But again, it's the quality, uh, not necessarily the quantity of apps that are available um, for Mac OS that, that are, that's really impressive to me. The fact that it feels like you have access to the cream of the crop in terms of software developers and what they're capable of. And I'd say most of this is because of the, the premium user base that's behind Mac OS. So that's my ramblings. That's my thoughts. Let me know in the comments what you think. And um, yeah, I guess we'll kind of wrap this one up because it's already been pretty long. See you guys in the next one. Definitely check out episode one of Adventures in Solace if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, I'll see you all in the next video. Peace out.